Underwriting for Auto Line this week has been provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week, where the discussion this day is going to be all about who's the executive of the year in the global automotive industry. I put together a terrific panel that will help me determine who that executive should be. And that panel includes Dr. David Cole, the founder for the Center for Automotive Research in Ann Arbor, also the co-founder co of Automotive Harvest. Next up is Edward Lapham, former columnist, managing editor, and, and I think editor-in-chief of yes. Automotive News, uh, published by Crane Communications. And Neil DeCoker, the founder of the Original Equipment Suppliers Association. And great having the three of you here with us on AutoLine this week. Great to be great here. Great to be with you. We should also mention two other people are part of this panel to determine the AutoLine Executive of the Year. They include Mary Ann Keller, Wall Street analyst and now the principal of Keller and Associates, and Carl Ludvigsen, who's based in London, an author, a consultant, and a former automotive executive himself. We've all been debating for the last two months who is the best executive out there? And we started out with a list of, I don't know, everybody in the industry, got that down to about a dozen or so, and then whittled that down to about a half a dozen. And now join me as we discuss who amongst they should be the executive of the year. Ed, let me throw out a name to start with you. Akio Toyota, the chairman of the Toyota Motor Company. Uh, Akio Toyota has done a terrific job with his family's business. He has made significant changes in the company, there's no doubt about it. He has focused the company during some, some highly publicized difficulties and got him back at, at, at work again. Uh, it may be a little early in his career yet to, to think that he's achieved that that plateau or that, that height where he needs to be. Toyota's made a, a, a remarkable resurgence since, you know, you go back a few years with uh, the quality problems and, you, and the like. But, you, but you're right. Maybe we need more of a, a track record. David, what's your thought? Oh, I think that's probably true. I, I've known him for uh, many, many years and think very highly of him. And I think he's the right person to lead Toyota. There's no question about that in my mind. He's a uh, tremendous interest in high-performance vehicles. Uh, he spent a lot of time uh, here in the U.S., both on the West Coast and went to business school on the East Coast, but it's a little early. Hmm. Neil, any thoughts? I agree with everything that's been said. He's a terrific person. I've had the privilege of meeting him and uh, tremendous presence. Uh, his leadership skills are outstanding. I think he's, uh, he's got a lot of good years left in him, and I think we've got a great opportunity in the future to make him executive of the year. And I know in, in some of the discussions and the like, there was some thought, you know, how much of this resurgence at Toyota really should be given to Akio? or is it the management level right below him too? So I, I think in time we'll, we'll get a clearer picture of that. We, we, we will, and he has recrafted the, the, the management core at Toyota, but he's also recrafted the board and he's brought in outsiders Absolutely. and, and non-Japanese directors. So he, so Including the first U.S. member yes, of, the, exactly. of the board. Yeah. But you know, he's a coach. And I think what we're seeing today is some of the most successful leaders are not kings, their coaches and what their focus is is making the team work not uh, extolling or uh, it's all about me yeah uh, let's go to another name on the list Carlos Goen uh, the chief executive at not just Nissan but also Renault Neil any thoughts about Carlos Goen Carlos is an amazing executive I, I can't imagine another individual in the world uh, being able to run two massive automotive companies completely different cultures, different halves of the earth, and being able to do it as effectively as he's done it. He turned Nissan around uh, very, very effectively, struggling with Renault and, uh, in Europe, as, is many, uh, as are many of the OEMs in Europe. Uh, he's a terrific executive. Uh, I just, uh, in discussing the many people we talked about, I felt that uh, uh, he is struggling with Renault especially, and that this is not the time to say you're the best executive in the industry today. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Nissan's resurgence has been astounding, especially yeah. when everybody else on the in, in the industry was ready to give up on it. Yeah. He he got that thing. Well, what he around. did when he went to Nissan is that he brought in uh, what I would say Western leadership values that the people in Nissan could not do. Yeah. He closed plants. He changed things. Uh, and if he hadn't done that, Nissan might have disappeared. So he did a fabulous job at Nissan. I, I got to know him actually before. Uh, he was with Renault, and one of the things you could see very early is that uh, he was a natural leader, and he's demonstrated that for many years. And I think uh, Louis Schweitzer, his pre precedent, or pre how do I Predecedent. say it? The guy before him is what I'm trying to say, <laughs> was the one who really recognized that they could do something with Nissan and sent Carlos to turn it around. So I, I, I think Schweitzer gets some of the credit for having recognized oh, there was absolutely. potential with Nissan. But your thoughts, Ed, on Carlos? I, I like what Carlos has done. Obviously, he is having problems in Europe. He's had some other issues inside the, the management team. At Nissan, things that need to be worked out, I think, to, to really give Nissan the sort of turbocharged uh, team that it needs to move ahead. Of course, this whole industry is wild and crazy right now. I mean, it's going to be that way for a long time. But one of the attributes that I think he has is he has a very multicultural approach. Uh, he's uh, uh, South America, the Middle East, uh, Europe, uh, Asia. And that's a tremendously valuable asset in, in this era of a globally connected industry. Because he clearly is a global executive. Absolutely. No, no doubt about it. Look, we've been talking about Toyota. We talked about Nissan. We've got to go to another Japanese company that I'm just blown away by in their performance, and that's Subaru. Uh, they are a company that did not even know that there was a great recession crippling the world economy. They just went from sales record to sales record to sales record. They're the little company that could, you know, at a time when most auto executives will say, oh, you need to be able to build six million cars a year as a car company to have the scale to compete. Right. Subaru, I think, sold 750,000 cars last year. You know, that's a drop in the bucket on a, on a global sale. Ed, any thoughts about Subaru? Well, it, Subaru has been... Um, very consistent in its its marketing its its product is is um, while not the most um, technologically advanced it is reliable it is dependable and it has a, a, a following of people who who know what the product can deliver they really understand their customer they do and the customers understand them and they understand who they are and what they want to be and that goes from the marketing in the United States back to the management in Japan well, they really attacked a market that nobody else was uh, really attacking, and they built their foundation there, and now it's spread out. But, of course, uh, they have partners now. They're partnering with uh, Toyota, and the scale issue, I think, is going to become more important in, in the future. But they really have done an amazing job for the size company they are. And, you know, what we should let the audience know, too, Subaru's spectacular success is largely an American phenomenon. And we weren't sure exactly who should be the executive that gets the credit. There's, uh, uh, I think, a very solid executive there, Tom Dahl, uh, who uh, has been there throughout this amazing, uh, amazing uh, surge that Subaru's done. There's also a guy, uh, Yasuyuki Yoshinaga, in Japan. But, you know, part of the things that we struggled with here is... Who really gets the credit for Subaru's amazing, you know, surge in the American market? And I think that's one reason why uh, we're still trying to figure out who, who is the, the real leader. Maybe there. that's their secret. Maybe it's the team and how that team is meshed together and, yeah. and worked effectively together as a really much smaller company without that horrendously large global scale. But they've done it. Mm -hmm. And this has been kind of their homeroom here anyway. Yeah. And from New Jersey. Yeah, based in New Jersey, at least for the U.S. market. Right. Yeah. The, the only Japanese automaker, in fact, the only Asian automaker on the East Coast, for historical reasons that go way back to the way that Subaru grew up in America. It pays to be different sometimes. <laughs> it does. It really does. Uh, Neil, let me ask you about Martin Winterkorn, the CEO of Volkswagen. He's a guy that we talked a lot about. Yeah, yeah, we sure spent a lot of time on him and Volkswagen. They're... Uh Big, hairy, audacious goal of uh, being number one uh, in 2018 and uh, 10 million vehicles a year and so forth is, uh, 
is a major significant uh, effort. The fact that they have uh, nine, 12, whatever uh, uh, vehicle lines, uh, nine brands and, and then also commercial vehicles, and they're able to manage it. Uh, here in the US, uh, we had to go from eight to four at General Motors to, to turn the company around and so forth, and here's a company that's able to manage very, very effectively multiple brands all over the world, very successful in almost every region. Uh, struggling a little bit in the U.S. right now, uh, but a very, very impressive uh, individual, very impressive company. Other thoughts? Well, I, I, you know, one of the things that Volkswagen had was one of the same things that Toyota had and, and Honda and so on is that uh, they came out of the same core. Uh, very different from Ford or GM where they had a European operation, a U.S. operation, and they had great differences. They didn't really have global scale, and I think what VW had is uh, from the beginning global scale. And so whether it was uh, Audi or VW or the other brands that uh, it was all built out of a global foundation with uh, the ruler living in Deutschland. Yes, indeed. I, and, and there is still some of that. There is the, the Passat plant in Chattanooga, which has its own issues trying to decide whether it, it wants to um, uh, form a, a relationship with the UAW or not at some level or another. And, you know, the Volkswagen plants around the world communicate with each other. And, and so they can, they can share best practices. For example, the Passat factory in, in Chattanooga shares with, with uh, um, the Passat factory in China. But, you know, they, don't, they can't always let the engineers in Germany know that an innovation wasn't German when they, <laughs> they put it in. So there are still issues. Yeah. There are issues. Uh, as you noted, the, the UAW thing, and Neil, as you pointed out, they're, they're struggling in the U.S. market right now, which is hard to figure out because the two prior years, their sales just shot up, and now they're dropping almost as fast as they came up. Uh, well, this is a crazy market. I, I mean, you look at the number of the players here, uh, you look at the excellence of the vehicles that mm -hmm. are being produced, uh, uh, but they're one of the very few car companies right now who's seen their sales go down all year long. That's right. Seriously hit. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, the other thing is uh, Volkswagen has gone on this uh, uh, quest that they call MQB, which is a way of designing cars around component sets, which, if it pays off, could be brilliant. But I think the jury still might be out on this because, you know, in some of our discussions, we, we noted that, this is enta in, uh, entailing very high design and engineering costs, and it is also going to entail very high manufacturing investment costs. And the other thing that we were a little bit uncertain as to whether Wintercorn was the right guy right now is, you know, they've come out and said, we're going to be number one in the world in 2018. And uh, you know, as you guys know, what we've said is, Rather than set goals of being number one or, right. you know, volume, let's focus on the customer first. You know, you take care of the customer, all these other things will start to drop in place. And th that's why I think the, the jury's still out on Oh, I, I would totally agree. I think we'll, we need to wait a while. If they are number one in a, in a few years. Uh, then we can put them in. Then we can yeah. put them in. But what we see today happening, and, and VW is an example of this, is tremendous innovation in terms of how to do things. And we used to think, for example, that lean was really good. It's not. It's lean agile. And it doesn't apply to just the manufacturing of plant. It applies to everything in the business. And, and so we're right now in a world where uh, things are moving pretty fast. And a couple of years from now, we can make a measurement on uh, winter corn. And one of the other things about about the desire to be number one is, you know, you need to be careful what you ask for because right. General Motors was number one and look what happened to General Motors and then Toyota was number one and look what happened to Toyota. Well, there's the old you know. saying that uh, market share is nice, but profits are essential. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Boy, isn't that the truth? Let's talk about Ford, Alan Mulally. Here's a guy that's gotten all kinds of accolades. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at uh, somebody like Alan, he is the epitome, in my judgment, of what I would say is a, a great coach leader. His focus is the team. Uh, he's demonstrated that. He has uh, dramatically streamlined Ford, and he's made everybody at Ford better. Yeah, but, you know, I think we have recognized Alan, uh, and he is just a superb individual. There is a discussion about is he going to become a software guy or go to Microsoft, but he is an absolutely outstanding leader on, on, on any measure that I can think of. 
It, it, the, what he's done with the, with the Ford team has been great. You know, Ford traditionally was one of the bloodiest um, companies in, in HR and in, in fighting and all that stuff. He seems to have done away with that. He seems to have smoothed things out. It looks at this point like it will last. But you, the one thing, the one Ford concept is what he's sort of hung everything else on. And that's really, I think, the core genius of, of what he's done there. Absolutely. Really creating Ford into one entity globally. You know, going back to your point earlier, Dave, that the way that Ford grew up, it had disparate regional right. companies. You know, there was a Ford of Europe, a Ford Latin America, Ford Asia. Now it's truly and, one and Ford. We, we, we brought a product, they brought a product in from Ford that was uh, the midsize European car that was smaller than the Ford compact car here. Yeah. And, and one Ford, one organization, all connected. It's a winning philosophy. I think the world of Alan, he's a very, very terrific executive and I think one of the things I really like about him is the way he's trained the next team to Absolutely. come along and they are ready to go and even though there's a pretty strong rumor about who's going to replace him uh, by having made Mark Field COO a year ago there are just some outstanding individuals in addition to Mark on the team that that could walk into that position and he deserves a lot of credit for uh, having developed those, that team. Ford may have the best bench yeah, in the business absolutely. right now. They, they've got a, uh, a lot of great executives yeah. right down the line. And they uh, think like a team. They, yeah. they do, and that's why uh, you know, I'm so impressed by Alan Mulally. He is the most unique executive I've ever met in my life, and he has definitely changed the culture, to your points. I mean, Ford used to be the most political, backstabbing, you know, watch yourself every step of your career kind of a company. Allen's changed that around. But as you all know, Ford's run into some quality issues lately. They, they've really been dinged uh, by Consumer Reports, by J.D. Power. Uh, they've had some issues. Um, I think if this was a year or two ago, Allen would probably be the guy, but maybe not this year. Well, the issue, uh, for example, is with the interface with the electronic world that is in a car, and, and we're struggling with this, and everybody is struggling with this. And, and in fact, if you look at the generational change, the people that buy cars are somewhat older in the generation, and they're used to buttons and knobs, and the kids, they live with menus, and uh, the whole industry has to work through this. And in fact, I think the first manufacturer that comes up with uh, you design your own instrument panel and, and cluster to control the vehicle and heat and all these things is probably going to be a big winner. But uh, this is, they just fell into that really tough spot of uh, pushing this whole electronic interface with a little bit uh, more of a focus on the teenager than the 50-year-old. And I, pre I predict, though, that those of us who grew up with knobs and buttons will become less of a market force <laughs> as time wears on. Unfortunately, you're I right. I think that's absolutely <laughs> certainty. <laughs> okay, we haven't gotten to General Motors yet. We've got to talk GM and the executives there. Another uh, team with a lot of bench strength to it. Thoughts? Well, I, I've got to talk about the product uh, just a little bit. I can't believe the quality of the product that's coming out of General Motors today. It is fantastic. It's world class. And I started with General Motors in 1962, and I, I worked there 23 years, and I've watched them go a long ways down in the 80s and 90s and so forth, and I've watched them come back, and they're absolutely world class, and somebody at General Motors uh, deserves an awful lot of credit for that, and I, I think certainly the product development, product engineering, manufacturing team uh, deserve a tremendous amount of credit for where GM is today. Yeah. yeah, I certainly agree. I think they've done a fabulous job with the product. And when you consider the low point uh, comparatively a few years ago with the bankruptcy and uh, really the tremendous problems of the industry, what most people uh, think of as the Great Recession, we had a depression in the auto industry. Absolutely. And when you take that much volume out, about four or five million units compared to what we thought, and now to come back uh, with the strength of the products today is, uh, is pretty special. I got to give Rick Wagner a lot of credit for the insight to hire Bob Lutz. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean that uh, Bob uh, Bob had a tremendous impact uh, in transform the their in product development the product. process. Yep, absolutely. I think that's right. He yeah. he he did. There was some evidence that his golden gut wasn't quite what it was at, at one point, but it was the process there that changed. Right. It was it was making the the designers and the engineers 
giving them some uh, mojo. Well, he, he took design and brought that up to a much higher level in the company. And uh, people like attractive <clears throat> products. And sometimes uh, the pure engineer is not as good at doing that as somebody that has those creative juices. But Bob's been gone for a while. He, he has. And mm -hmm. in fact, when you look at General Motors right now, we all know Europe's a basket case. Latin America, there's issues. It's up, it's down, it's making progress, but it's not golden. Uh, Asia's going pretty good for them, China especially. But as you all know, half the vehicles they sell in China are these little Wuling minivan Perfect. things. And uh, so I'm not as impressed with GM's performance in China as, for example, I am with Volkswagen's success in China. So when you look at General Motors, the, the, the shining you know, part of the corporation right now is North America. And of course, Mark Royce is in charge of that operation. Dave, your yeah, thought, Mark, and, and we should let everybody know, your father was president of General Motors way back when. Way back so, when. The, so you've got a, a real you know, uh, affinity for this company. Well, I try to be as, uh, you know, I, I like them all. I think this is a wonderful industry, but uh, I got to know Mark when he was a kid. And he was an athlete. Uh, he was always a team guy. Uh, he's a very smart guy. And I'll tell you a quick story that really sank in with me. Uh, during the chaos, uh, a couple of people I knew were going to lose their dealerships. Uh, one of them was Craig Weirda in, in Holland. And I got Holland, hold, Michigan. Holland, Michigan. That's <laughs> right. I got a hold of, uh, of Mark, and he talked to Craig. And I talked to Craig afterwards, and I said, what do you think? He said, this guy is sensational. Because when they talked, Mark said, I don't know that much about dealers. I'm learning. And when he said that, that said, this is a different kind of a leader because he's telling you what the world is really like inside his body. Yeah, yeah. Neil, Neil, your thoughts on Mark Royce? Oh, I, I think he's terrific. Uh, I've known him for some time, but he spoke at our annual conference at OESA in uh, 2009 when he had just come back from Australia. He was vice president of engineering just before he picked up the North American responsibility. And uh, he wowed the audience. I mean, he absolutely had 600 people in the audience, and they, they ranked him just one of the best speakers we've ever had. He just, the way he answered questions, his knowledge of the product, the Great. way he was able to talk about just about anything and mm -hmm. what was coming up and how it performed and, you know, what excited him and what excited consumers. He just had a real mm -hmm. feel. He's a, he's a car guy. He, he's a car guy for sure. And, you know, most Friday afternoons, he's out at the, at the, um, proving Grounds in Milford, looking at a new product. He and Mary Barr, the product honcho, go out and they get seat time and the hot vehicles. They take them out not only around the, the, the Proving Grounds, but they go out and flog them through the uh, Twisties and, and Dexter and, and, and out near Ann Arbor. And it, it, they're, they are really people who understand and like the product. They like to get their hands on it. They like to work on vehicles. They like to they like to be a part of it. And I think that, you know, having a, a, a car guy uh, at the top of General Motors just makes so much, so much sense. I think oh, I he's agree. more than a car guy, though. Mark is a guy. I mean, listen to what you're saying, Dave. The, the dealers that you've talked right. to love this guy. Neil, you're saying the suppliers yeah. love this guy. Mm -hmm. Ed, you're saying, you know, the, the people in product love what this guy's doing. To me, that's more than just a car guy, somebody who knows product. This is somebody who's a leader. He, he is a leader, and he understands the complexity of this business. And when you think about it, and if you go back to the task force coming to Detroit, they said, I drive a car, therefore I understand the auto industry. They didn't have a clue. Yeah. This is the most complex industry in the world. And when you have somebody like Mark that understands what's going on in product development, uh, going on in manufacturing, and then really brings that out in terms of uh, his leadership style, that really works. And, and again, I would emphasize, Mark was an athlete. He played baseball. He was on a team. And you don't show up with nine catchers and expect to win games. You show up with people that have their respective roles to play. Teams win, individuals don't. And I think this is one of the most important aspects of leadership. And what we're seeing today is this transition from sort of the historic coach or the, the, the king leader to more of a coach leader that builds a team. This is Alan Mulally. This is Mark. And part of that, there's, uh, there is uh, a lack of the arrogance you might, right. you might expect for someone who has accomplished what he's done and what he's made and moved. And 
you know, being the son of a General Motors president. Right. He's just very comfortable with himself. Yes. Uh, Alam Ali, very comfortable with himself. Therefore, I have no problem giving accolades to other people. They're part of the team. I'm the coach. So I guess what we should do is let the audience know now that this is a, a microcosm of the two months of talks and emails and discussions that we've been having, starting with this, this big list, whittling it down. And we should let everybody know that the executive of the year by our panel's choice, including Mary Ann Keller and Carl Ludvigson, who couldn't be here with us, is Mark Royce. It was unanimous. And it was unanimous. Absolutely. Yeah. And we had lots of discussions back and forth and, and got into all kinds of pluses and minuses, but Mark is the guy that came out number one. Well, he's demonstrated tremendous capability in a relatively short time when he became visible. He did a great job when he was in Australia. And what you can see is a very good pathway ahead for GM and with the kind of leadership that uh, Mary Barr and Mark and, and the others on the team have provided. Well, I want to thank all three of you for having come in and shared this. And I know Mary Ann and Carl would have done the same had they been able to make it here. But Dr. David Cole, uh, Edward Lapham, Neil DeCoker, I want to thank you all for having come in and selected the very first AutoLine Executive of the Year. It was great to be a part of it, John. It you really was. It was wonderful it was a to fun. be a part of it. A lot of fun. Love. I just wish we weren't quite so old. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah, Neil likes being old. <laughs> I don't want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Underwriting for Auto Line this week has been provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge.